Welcome to part four of this webinar series on systematic reviews and meta-analyses. In parts one to three, I reviewed what SRMAs are, the steps in conducting the systematic review, and in the conduct of the meta-analysis. In this video, I will review an approach to assess how to interpret the results of a SRMA. My only disclosure is that I am currently a MITAX Elevate postdoctoral fellow jointly funded by the Government of Canada and the Canadian Sugar Institute. The last aspect of a well-conducted SRMA includes an assessment of the certainty of evidence. One method that can be used to assess how confident we are in the overall estimate of the effect is GRADE, which stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development and Evaluation. Many international organizations have provided input into the development of the GRADE approach, which is now considered the standard in guideline development. The biggest strength of an SRMA is that when limitations and heterogeneity are properly acknowledged and handled, Systematic reviews and meta-analyses have the potential to provide the best evidence for efficacy, safety, and or effectiveness in nutritional sciences research. The biggest limitation of well-conducted SRMAs is that they are dependent on the data available and on the quality of those studies from which the data is obtained. Thus, well-conducted SRMAs need to include a method applied, such as GRADE, to incorporate the limitations and heterogeneity and quality of the available data into the interpretation of the conclusions drawn. There are a large collection of papers published which explain how to assess each aspect of the GRADE approach. This should impress upon you that this is no quick and easy task and does, does require strong knowledge of the GRADE, grade approach. My objective in this short presentation is to provide you with an overview of the steps you have, so you have a general idea of how it is applied and its importance. GRADE is an assessment of the certainty of evidence, that is the extent to which we are confident that an estimate of the effect or association is correct. To clarify what this means, let's look at a force plot. As a reminder, the data extracted from individual studies is uploaded into a software program, which then meta-analyzes the data to provide an overall estimate of the effect of all included studies, which you can see at the bottom of the force plot as the green diamond. So the meta-analysis includes taking the data extracted from each individual study and generating an overall estimate of the pooled effect of the intervention compared to the control and the outcome of interest. This green diamond, the overall estimate of the effect, is where the conclusion of the SRMA comes from. And this is what we are applying the great approach to in order to assess how confident we are that it is correct. After completing the steps in the great approach, which I will review in a moment, you will give an overall estimate of the uh, effect reported in the SRMA, a grade of either high, moderate, low, or very low, each of which has a definition. For example, a grade of high means we are very confident that the true effect lies close to that of the estimate of the effect. However, a grade of low means that our confidence in the effect estimate is limited and the true effect may be substantially different from the estimate of the effect. The level you start at depends on the type of studies included in the SRMA. If the SRMA includes randomized controlled trials, it starts with a grade of high since they have the least bias, whereas a SRMA including observational studies starts with a grade of low since these studies have greater bias. From that starting point, you then assess various factors to rate up or down. The first here includes individual study limitations, which is the risk of bias assessment performed for each individual study 
to assess the quality of the included studies. Recall that in assessing risk of bias for each individual study, there are various domains to assess in which bias can occur. In clinical trials, these domains include, for example, whether randomization was used. In risk of bias assessment tools, these domains are assessed for whether there is high or low bias, or whether it is unclear or to varying degrees, depending on the version of the tool you are using. Here's an example of the risk of bias assessment for ASRMA of clinical trials. Looking at the results, where you see a lot of red, this means that there was high risk of bias determined for a domain in a study. This is a proportional summary graph, which summarizes the ratings in each of the domains in all included studies. These re reports can be used to assess the grade factor for individual study limitations. If you see a lot of red and judge that most studies suffered from high bias and were of low quality, it may be judged to downgrade for individual study limitations. To review an easy example, this SRMA plotted the risk of bias results in the force plot. You can see the vast majority of studies were assessed as having low risk of bias, as depicted in green. Therefore, it is likely that for individual study limitations, we would not downgrade this SRMA. The next factor to assess for grade is inconsistency of results which is the heterogeneity in the meta-analysis. Recall our classical example of heterogeneity, where we have two studies with opposite results, one showing an increase and one showing a reduction as a result of the intervention. Heterogeneity here is 98%. This is found beside the I squared, which is the outcome of the statistical test along with the p-value, that we would wanna look for in the forest plot to see what the heterogeneity of the analysis is. This example demonstrates that the results of these two studies are likely due to the very different environments or study designs and probably not just due to chance. If you have substantial and significant heterogeneity, this would result in a judgment to downgrade your certainty in the evidence, that is reduce how certain you are in the overall estimate of the meta-analysis. So going back to our grade slide, we started at high, and now as a result of the fact that there is substantial and significant heterogeneity, we would judge that there is inconsistency of the results and thus downgrade our certainty of evidence from high to moderate. Recall that there are ways in which we can explore explanations for heterogeneity, which include performing sensitivity analyses or subgroup analyses. If you find that you can explain heterogeneity, there may be reason to judge that we do not have to downgrade for inconsistency of results. The next factor to assess is indirectness of the evidence, which is considering, considering whether the included studies can directly answer the research question. Some questions to consider when thinking about indirectness are, what was the research question of the SRMA? Who are the results intended to be generalizable to? To help provide you with the answers to these questions, review the objective of the SRMA and take a look at what the PCOTS definition would be for the included trials. So that would be what was the population, the intervention, the comparator, outcome, time of follow-up, and setting of the included trials. Lastly, review the table of study characteristics, as this will help you to see a general overview of the study population included, as well as other important factors. Based on your review of these items, you can then consider who the conclusions are generalizable to based on the included studies. You can also consider whether the included data directly answers the original research question. Let's consider a simple example of a SRMA with the research question, how does X affect cholesterol levels in the general population? If there were only a few studies included in the meta, 
let's say three studies, and all were conducted in young, healthy women, where the primary outcome was not on cholesterol, but on another outcome, like let's say inflammation, then we may judge to downgrade for indirectness since the con conclusions cannot be generalized to the general population as they really only apply to young, healthy women. Conversely, if from all included studies, the participants captured represent the target population of the research question and the data of the studies directly answer the original research question, then one may conclude that they do not feel there is a serious concern for indirectness and thus would not downgrade. The next factor to consider is imprecision, in which we reflect on the overall estimate of the pooled effect and whether it is meaningful. This one is a bit more difficult to understand and perform. Different groups may interpret and assess this factor slightly differently. According to GRADE, for practice guidelines, rating down the quality of evidence, that is the confidence in the estimates of effect, is required if clinical action would differ if the upper versus the lower boundary of the confidence interval represented the truth. Thus, in our practice, we have developed a set of what we call minimally important differences for various outcomes, which we have performed SRMAs on. These values represent the effect you would need to see in order for it to be clinically meaningful. So for example, for hemoglobin A1C, an effect of at least 0.3% is considered clinically relevant. So if the 95% confidence interval of the main effect overlaps 0.3%, we would downgrade for imprecision. To show you how this can be done, here is an example. Take a look at the 95% confidence interval for the overall estimate of the effect. Considering a clinically meaningful difference in hemoglobin A1C is 0.3%, the 95% confidence interval overlaps this, which means that the true effect may not be clinically meaningful. Thus, we may judge to downgrade for imprecision. Next is publication bias. If in the assessments of publication bias performed in the SRMA, they were not significant, it will likely be judged not to down, rate down uh, for publication bias. If it was significant, there may be reason to downgrade. However, there are methods which can be applied to address publication bias, like a trim and fill analysis, and these can provide additional information to use in assessing whether one should downgrade for publication bias. Here's an example where you can see that there was no significant publication bias as there is no great asymmetry in the funnel plot and neither the Eggers nor the Beggs tests are significant for the test for publication bias. Therefore, in this example, we may judge not to downgrade. Finally, there are three factors to rate up uh, in, a great, in the grade approach, which includes a dose response gradient, which comes from dose response analyses, a large magnitude of effect in which we see how big the overall effect is, and confounding. The latter two here apply principally to cohort studies and even then are not commonly found in SRMAs in nutrition. So to review, to assess the certainty of evidence in the estimates of the overall effect of an SRMA, you would first consider each of these factors and whether there is cause to judge them that the certainty should be downgraded or upgraded for each. Let's say we had a SRMA of randomized controlled trials, then we would start with a grade of high. But if you determined that you judge there's reason to downgrade for let's say inconsistency and indirectness and not the others, then applying these, you would rate down for inconsistency and then down for indirectness 
Thus, the overall grade would be low in this example. From the definition here, an overall rating of low means that our confidence in the estimate of the effect is limited and the true effect may be substantially different from the estimate of the effect. Thus, we should interpret the conclusions with some caution. Remember that the biggest strength of a SRMA is that when limitations and heterogeneity are appropriately acknowledged and handled, systematic reviews and meta-analyses have the potential to provide the best evidence for efficacy, safety, and or effectiveness in nutritional sciences research. The biggest limitation of well-conducted SRMAs is that they are dependent on the data available and the quality of these studies from which data is obtained. This highlights the importance of applying a method to assess how confident we are in the overall estimate of the effect, such as GRADE, which many or international organizations have provided input into and is now considered the standard and guideline development. It is important to conduct a SRMA according to the best standards, as it is to apply a method to assess how to interpret the conclusions drawn. Although there is a lot to understand when performing a grade assessment, I hope that the short presentation provided a base of knowledge on how it is performed and its importance. I'd like to acknowledge my mentors and lab group as many of these slides have been developed and shared by members of our team.